Computers operate with zeros and ones. You've probably heard that phrase before, but what does it actually mean? In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the internal components of a computer, and we're going to describe how it works based on zeros and ones, and how we can convert those zeros and ones to things that make more sense to us. Things like numbers, and letters, and even colors and sounds. After that, we're going to take a look at a program and how it determines how to interpret these zeros and ones as data types. Uh, we'll look at the debugger at the color match search algorithm in plainplaces.com. So first, what, is, what makes up a computer? In my introductory programming classes, I often ask people who has purchased a computer recently. And out of 24 people, maybe three or four will raise their hands. And then I'll ask them for specifications on their computer. What's the CPU speed? Uh, how much RAM is there, what's the hard disk, so on and so forth. After that, I ask for a show of hands on who has purchased a phone. And usually, within the last year or so, usually uh, a large amount of people in class have purchased a phone within the last six months, usually about 50% or so. Well, really, a phone is a computer anymore. The line of what a computer is is, is gray now. Uh, you know, we used to think of a computer as either a laptop or a desktop, but now not so much. So in a computer, we're going to have a central processing unit, which is made of an integrated circuit. And you see here we have uh, basically conductors that are going to receive messages through the computer's bus. Okay, so it's going to receive messages either as pulses of electricity or as a lack of pulse. And that's how we get that concept of zeros and ones. Uh, a pulse would be a one, a lack of a pulse would be a zero. So this, is, this integrated circuit is doing computations very quickly. Uh, we, get, you know, we get different clock speeds, which is how quickly it can process a, a set of operations. Now an operation wouldn't be something like save. Save is actually a collection of many operations. So when you think of an operation, it's the operation to the to the CPU is a much smaller unit. A save can be uh, saving a document might result in changing a, a lot of attributes on the physical storage of the computer. So there could be a lot of things that go on. Okay. Uh, also, if you think about rendering a video, a video it, the, the CPU has to control the color of every pixel on your screen. There are many operations involved in that, which is why sometimes it takes a little bit of time for a video to load. Now, while the computer is operating, we will have random access memory, which is temporary memory. <clears throat> it's memory only while the computer is turned on. It's memory for your applications that are currently running. So a lot of times you'll hear 4 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes uh, or maybe 16 gigabytes if you're lucky. Uh, so this is the, the amount of knowledge that the RAM can hold. So uh, we, we think about a lot of these terms in gigabytes, terabytes, megabytes, kilobytes. Uh, what does that all mean? We'll take a look at that in just a moment. But the RAM, the memory in the computer, is what is temporary memory that's just for programs that are running. This is where your documents live uh, before you hit save or even while you're viewing them on the computer. A hard disk is persistent memory because that memory will be around even when we turn off the computer. And what we'll see here is we have a platter, which is the shiny surface here, which is essentially a magnetic media. And the magnetic media can be addressed in very small increments. Uh, so it's a magnetic plate with very small address sizes. And as a matter of fact, uh, hard disks have gotten more and more storage because they've managed to make that addressable space on the hard disk even smaller and smaller over time. When I was in college, I bought my first computer in 1994 and it had a 40 megabyte hard drive. And at the time, that was a whole lot of information. So 40 megabytes is basically 40,000 kilobytes. Uh, 40,000 kilobytes is uh, well, a whole lot of bytes, I'll tell you that, probably about 40 million bytes or so, just doing the math in my head. Uh, and a byte is uh, how we store information, so we'll look at that uh, in just a moment. But nowadays, you can get one terabyte hard drives, or 
50 gigabyte hard drives or 500 gigabyte hard drives. So uh, thousands of times more storage capacity than I had on my first computer in 1994. And we have to remember the difference. In 94, we were saving a lot of times uh, documents onto floppy disks, and the hard drive only would have the software that runs the computer itself, uh, the operating system and the applications. So that computer with a 40 gigabyte hard drive had Windows 3.1, uh, Works, which is a watered down version of Word, and Excel, it had a, a browser, all of this in 40 megabytes. That's an incredibly small amount of memory. You could download an app on your phone now and the whole thing would be 40 megabytes. Uh, a video like the one you're watching will be much more than 40 gigabytes, just this video itself. So the difference in the last 20 years or so has been that we are doing more with sound, with media, with video, with pictures, and these things take up a lot of memory. But the question is, how do we get from sounds and colors and video, how do we get to these zeros and ones, okay? So uh, the platter holds the basically the charge or the lack of charge, the zeros and ones. The head, the read-write head, uh, the platter will spin, and the read-write head can read or write to the platter, okay? A lot of times you'll hear about defrag. Uh, if you have a very full hard drive, it's looking in little nooks and crannies and where to store information might be spread out all over the hard drive. So a defrag, if you have some space available on your hard drive, it will reorder things and put them in a more logical order so your hard drive has to do less seeking and searching. It can be a lot faster that way. Okay. Uh, finally, the motherboard is what connects everything together. Uh, so this this is an interesting motherboard. We have our uh, RAM up here, and what you have here is where the central processing unit will go. What's interesting is this is what's called a ZIF socket, uh, which is something I remember from my days of selling computers, also in the 90s, where the idea was you could pop out the central processor, pop in a new central processor, and upgrade your computer, and that's something I did. My first computer had a 486SX50 processor. When the Pentiums came out, I was able to take that processor out, buy a new processor from Intel, and plop that new processor right in and get a performance boost and make my computer last a little bit longer. That was back when computers were about $3,000 a piece, so upgradability was definitely a feature that we looked for. And, you know, if we could just upgrade the components, we could keep the computer much longer and not have to spend that much money. So the motherboard holds all the components together. Uh, nowadays, you'd have things like IDE cables, uh, but here's a VGA cable for a monitor and probably some PS2 ports for the mouse and the keyboard. Again, nowadays, those would probably be IDEs. So uh, the bus is what lets everything talk to each other. Okay. So over time, this has gotten smaller and smaller, and we've gotten things that aren't heavy, uh, and people like this. Uh, you get tablets where it doesn't take a long time to boot up. You can easily store and carry it, okay? And then you get mobile phones. And many of these concepts still apply with a mobile phone. You still have a central processing unit. You still have RAM. Yeah, it won't look like this, but it does exist. It'll be a lot smaller. You won't have a hard disk. In place of a hard disk, you'll have something like an SD card like you would have for a camera, and that holds persistent memory without moving parts, which means it can be very quick. Okay, you can have a little guy like this, uh, quick access to data, and less chance of failure. With a hard drive, because you do have moving parts, there's always a chance that something will fail, uh, and that's something we have to be careful about. That's something we have to be guarded against. So those are the components that make up a computer, whether it is a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, or a mobile phone. Uh, one other big transition we've seen, if you think about a, a traditional computer, a lot of times we were, uh, if you go back even about 10 years, a lot of times anytime we wanted to do any communication with the computer, it was via a network cable or a floppy disk, and a lot of the computer's components were meant to be plugged in. Nowadays, with mobile phones, 
that's not something that we always have to have because we're more used to doing things wirelessly. We can download apps from the Play Store or the App Store without plugging our phone into anything. We can communicate with others without plugging into anything. You can use the near field communication on a phone to pay for something uh, like your groceries and it will know your payment media. It will also know your loyalty number and all you have to do is be near the payment device. So a lot of things that we used to require physical contact or some kind of plug-in, uh, no longer, no longer with mobile phones, it's no longer the case. With my phone, uh, I have an LG G2, and this option's available on a lot of other phones as well. I don't even have to plug it in to charge it. I have a little charging pad, and I can just lay the phone physically on that charging pad, uh, and the phone charges. And then I take the phone off, and, and there we go, it's charged. By not connecting, by not plugging things in, it, it extends the life a lot because uh, you can think of a lot of things that have been ruined by pulling the cord out improperly and then the cord breaks. Or uh, maybe you pick up your laptop and you forget it's plugged into a monitor and you pull it away and then you pull the monitor with it and then that messes up the, you know, the serial connection with the monitor. Uh, by having wireless connectivity, by having a lot of features delivered over wireless that didn't used to be delivered over wireless, uh, you know, there's less chance for breaking your phone. Now, of course, you could drop it also. That's, you know, that's a risk. But, uh, but, but that also cuts down on the amount of physical interface that we need. Uh, so, very nice. A printer cable. How many times do you print things anymore? A lot of times, like if you check in for a flight, all you have to do is have the QR code visible on your phone, hand it to the TSA agent or the person checking you in, and they can scan it. So no need to print anything. So that's a big uh, evolution that has occurred in computers and in programming uh, from the days of being a mainframe where you had a central computer and a lot of dummy terminals to the days of client server where you had a PC or a laptop connected on a network doing a lot of work. Uh, to the days where we exchange things by floppy disk, to now the days where the phone is always with you and the phone is able to function uh, and collaborate with others in a completely wireless mode. So that's a look at a, a history of computers from mainframes up until uh, the recent days of computers on your belt and a mobile phone or a tablet with you. Uh, in the next video, we're going to take a look at how we can convert media, colors, sounds to a set of zeros and ones. We'll see you then. Thank you.